The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency is expressing alarm over safety issues at the, at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Russian forces seized the plant in early March after a fight that led to a fire near one of the plant's reactors. This week, the Ukrainian government accused Russia of launching two cruise missiles that flew at low altitudes over the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukraine says Russian missiles have also flown over two other nuclear power plants in Ukraine. The IAEA director general, Rafael Grossi, described the situation at the plant as a red light blinking issue. Zaporizhia is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, and it's located in the largest city in southeastern Ukraine, still under Ukrainian control. During a news briefing Thursday in Vienna, Grossi addressed the reports of Russian missiles flying over nuclear power plants. Any such um, um, development, if confirmed, would be extremely serious. I have been saying from the first day of this uh, crisis that the physical integrity of nuclear facilities is an absolute must. And of course, a, a, a missile going astray or something like this could have significant, um, a very significant impact. But we, we need to go back to Saporizia. It's, it's extremely important. In Saporizia, you have um, uh, uh, tens of uh, thousands of uh, nuclear material, plutonium, enriched uranium, uh, and we have to be uh, verifying uh, that. So it's still the, the open question that we have at the moment. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi speaking Thursday after returning from a trip to Ukraine, where he visited the Chernobyl nuclear power station on Monday, on the 36th anniversary of the plant's meltdown. Russia seized Chernobyl in late February and occupied the highly contaminated area until late March. Grossi vowed to help Ukraine repair damage caused during Russia's occupation. He praised workers at the plant for helping to prevent what could have been another nuclear disaster. In this case, what we had was a nuclear safety situation that was uh, not normal, that could have developed into, into an accident. I think the first credit must go to the operators, to these people here, because they carried on their work in spite of all the difficulties, in spite of the stress, in spite of the fact that they could not be working normally, they continued uh, working as if nothing had happened, so they kept the situation stable, uh, so to speak. The 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster was the worst nuclear meltdown in world history. We're joined now by Alexei Pasyuk. He is deputy director of the Ukrainian NGO EcoAction, where his focus is on energy and nuclear energy. Joining us from Ukraine, Alexei, thanks for being with us once again. Can you talk about this week? I mean, the significance of the 36th anniversary of Chernobyl, with the IAEA director coming um, to mark that, and at the same time, a few days later, these reports that Russian missiles flew very low down over the largest nuclear power complex in Europe, uh, it's Zaporizhia. Um, indeed, uh, I mean, uh, Chernobyl is exactly uh, a place which demonstrates what the nuclear e industry accident could be, right? It's a huge areas of land which are continue to be polluted with radioactive uh, materials. Back in 86, it was a huge impact for people who lived there. You, you had uh, hundred thousands who had to flee. Uh, and it was an uh, amazing cost because uh, basically it's still Soviet Union which started to deal with the with the accident. It's uh, only recently we finally got a safe containment of a destroyed reactor, which uh, um, international community paid over two billion dollars. Uh, so yes, and of course uh, this is particularly kind of. Uh, a great demonstration uh, that the, of the risk when Russians are coming, uh, Russian army came and occupied Chernobyl power plant. I mean, that's the site where we don't have a operating uh, nuclear reactors, so it's less of the risk of the accident of that scale, but we have a spent nuclear fuel there, which could also be uh, destroyed and have a release of radioactive materials in the air. 
But, uh, but of course, Zaporizhia, where you have uh, reactors in operation and they continue to work now, is far more dangerous situation also because it was directly attacked. You know, I, I have to remind that this concern was in place back from 2014 when the war started in Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine and it was just a couple of hundred kilometers away. And there was already then a discussion, what if missile basically goes the wrong way and attack uh, reactors themselves or the nuclear spent uh, storage uh, facility and we will have a release. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, uh, what happened is that actually we just had an attack when uh, this, the site was shelled by, by Russian tanks, and uh, it was a very serious accident um, because uh, there are different scenarios of what can go wrong at the nuclear power plant, and you don't necessarily need to be directly heating um, reactor or storage. Uh, to cause problem, because uh, the, these are the systems where you constantly have to cool down the fuel, and if you have an interruption in electricity supply and cooling systems stop operating, you, you start getting into this uh, accident of uh, fuel melting. Uh, can you comment on, despite the fact of the risks, um, there are reports that European nations are um, embracing the possibility, investing in more nuclear energy uh, to be less reliant on gas and oil. Um, what would this mean? And also, what does it mean for Ukraine? What message do you have for them? Well, there, indeed, there are a few of these uh, discussions, uh, but uh, I, I think there are like, different voices on that. Uh, for example, in Europe, with all the gas crisis, uh, nuclear is being considered as one of the answers. Uh, not so much about building new reactors because it's long and very expensive, but also there is also an option to uh, extend lifetime of existing reactors, like and in particular. Germany was uh, looking into these options to uh, not to close reactors which uh, they're supposed to close. And they come up with the kind of uh, assessment that it will not make sense, that the risks associated with uh, nuclear is far bigger than benefit, particularly, for example, in this story with uh, natural gas. The issue is that uh, gas is, uh, to a large degree, is used for industry and for heating, while um, uh, that would not be simply compensated by electricity. It's a far more complicated um, issue. But I think it's interesting that now we have this demonstration of, uh, you know, of a rather theoretical story. It was always theoretical. What happens if uh, there is a military attack on nuclear? And it was never properly considered. It was always seen as something uh, not very realistic. Um, but now everywhere it should be considered as the kind of uh, set, setting up a, a, a nuclear bomb of a kind, let's say, uh, which can become um, attacked and have um, uh, destruction. You know, it, it brings me back to to the my my school time when we have the big independence movement in late uh, 80s in Ukraine, uh, still as a part of Soviet Union, and I was handled you know these leaflets uh, on streets of Kiev where there were a map of Ukraine with the reactors uh, um, uh, being shown, and the, the article basically was saying, look, Soviet Union, Russia have planted these nuclear bombs on our territory. And, of course, it was this post-Chernobyl moment where the whole anti-nuclear movement was very much uh, connected to independence. But now we're basically getting the proofs that it's very real, it's very practical, and uh, that nuclear brings so many uh, security issues that, um, um, yeah, that it doesn't force it. 
I also would point out on the political leverage that Russia is getting with nuclear technology. We currently have in European Union a number of uh, countries which operate Soviet-designed reactors and which are dependent on Russian uh, fuel. So it's uh, it's similar to gas. You know, we we are constantly we're talking about these gas wars between Ukraine, Russia, Europe, Russia. It was happening for the last couple of decades uh, when they would just uh, cut on supply. Well, let me uh, ask but, you something uh, on that issue yeah. of um, um, Soviet reactors, <clears throat> Russian reactors. Um, the U.S. and Europe are imposing a number of sanctions on Russian oil and gas. Interestingly, the U.S. is not imposing sanctions on Russian uranium, which it imports. Can you comment on this? Do you think it should be included in the sanctions list? Yes, it certainly should be. I, I think it's, uh, you know, this war is very important. As West don't want to directly intervene military, it should use uh, uh, these economic uh, uh, tools. And uh, Rosatom, this nuclear Russian company, this is exactly one of the tools which, as I just was saying, Russia is using as political tool internationally. Um, and uh, it should be basically under sanctions as well. There are some of the steps which are happening, um, for example, in Germany, the, there are some common joint companies which are reviewing the agreement with Russia, but most of the company, companies don't. And I think this is also a moment which exposes how much um, different countries, including U.S., are dependent on Russian nuclear uh, industry. So, yes, I, I definitely would say that uh, all kind of sanctions on uh, Russian energy supply and nuclear in particular should be uh, implemented. Unfortunately, it's complicated. I think it's a problem that we don't realize the scale. For example, for example, what have happened in last week that despite there is a ban on the um, plane flying to to Russia uh, from Europe, there was a special agreement to have one plane coming from Russia to Slovakia to bring nuclear fuel. So this is, um, I mean, that shows the scale of uh, this kind of dependence and importance of that. And you have this incredible irony that, the, of course, President Volensky is really pushing hard for sanctions to be imposed um, by European countries in the U.S. on Russia, oil and gas. But you've got the pipelines of Russia going through Ukraine to Europe. and. Ukraine is not cutting those off. I think 30 percent um, of the fuel that goes through there, um, uh, 30 percent of Europe's fuel that goes through there is through Ukraine. Yeah, but uh, because, I mean, it would be probably wrong politically for Ukraine now dictate Europe whether it buys it or not. It asks, right? Uh, so, uh, of course, it's important to maintain there, especially in the situation when uh, the, the way out is uh, really uh, defeating Russia on the ground, uh, which Ukraine is uh, struggling to do. And uh, it brings us back to the situation in Zaporizhia. You know, uh, the reality is that we cannot guarantee nuclear safety in Ukraine unless the war is over. And we have to remember that Russian army is still staying at Zaporizhia power plant, which is still operating. Uh, and the issue is we don't know how it will uh, uh, be over, because now it's a kind of a situation of some kind of uh, unclear stability when we don't know what is happening on the station, but there is uh, not active uh, combat is happening. Uh, but at a certain moment, Russian troops will need to retreat, and we don't know how how, how it will be happening. Alexei, we want to thank there. you so much for being with us. Uh, Alexei Pasyuk, uh, deputy director of the Ukrainian NGO EcoAction, focusing on energy and particularly nuclear energy. Please be safe speaking to us from Western Ukraine.